Welcome everyone as we continue our parish Bible study. We're now, this is an exciting day because not only are we in the season of Lent, we are now starting a new book of the Bible. We've only gotten through two books of the Bible over the course of our Bible study, which has now gone on for a number of months. But that's great because we spend a lot of time reading and, and, and reflecting on uh, each and every verse. Thank you, first off, to everybody for their input on uh, what to read next. I know um, that I had put that out there a couple of weeks ago over the last few weeks leading up to Lent. And we did receive a lot of um, submissions, either by word of mouth or by phone. And um, in terms of, you know, just the numeric quantity of the different uh, opinions that were expressed to me, uh, the majority wanted to stay with St. Paul to keep reading St. Paul. Um, so I think, as we talked about last week, Ephesians is a nice to turn to because it's not as long as, for instance, 1 Corinthians or Romans. And also, it has a lot to, of course, just like all the letters of St. Paul, has a lot to offer us for our spiritual life, especially now as we're entering into Lent. So we will enter into St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians today over the course of who knows how long it will take us to get through Ephesians, but that's okay. There's no no issue with that. Yeah. So Ephesians is, it's actually easy to find because uh, Galatians was our last one, obviously. In terms of the, the canon, you just turn to the next um, letter and you'll find um, Ephesians. I do want to talk briefly about, um, you know, kind of set the stage for the letter, what it's about. Um, don't want to spend forever on that, but it's important to have a little bit of a context as we enter in. And then a lot of that will kind of uncover as we move along and reading through the letter. Um, just by way of introduction, Ephesians is uh, different than the other two letters we've read in a number of ways. So you remember we read First Thessalonians and Galatians, both of which are, many scholars agree, to be the first extant texts in the New Testament, written right around 50 or 55 A.D., so not long after, of course, Jesus' resurrection and all of that. Ephesians is towards the end of Paul's ministry and his life, actually, as well. We talked last week about how Paul was, somebody had a question about when Paul, you know, died. He died right around 62 AD when he was beheaded in Rome. This letter, Ephesians, along with two other letters, um, are referred to as the captivity epistles or the captivity letters. Because, why captivity? Because they were most likely written, traditionally we understand that to be, have been written, during Paul's captivity, his imprisonment in the city of Rome that led up to his beheading, his, his being killed. So again, most scholars, well, traditionally speaking, so there's some divergence, you know, more modern times with a lot of different biblical scholars, but traditionally we understand this letter as having been written in that captivity period. So somewhere around 60 to 62 or 63 A.D. So again, towards the end of Paul's ministry, towards the end of his life, it's being written to this city of Ephesus, which is located in uh, Asia Minor, modern day Asia Minor. Big uh, deal in the early church, Ephesus was. John the Apostle goes to, to live in Ephesus. Mary, the mother of God, goes to live there. So, you know, it's, a, it's quite a place in, in um, early Christianity. Um, another thing that's unique about uh, Ephesians is, uh, remember with 1 Thessalonians and Galatians, it was Paul who had founded those communities. Do you remember that? That he was the one who had went there and really brought about Christianity and the church for the first time. So his relationship to those communities was much like a father to children. Remember that imagery, that, that metaphor that kept being used throughout those two letters of you know, a father to his children. Even he used in Thessalonians the image of him as a mother, right, to his children. In terms of Ephesians, Book of Acts tells us that Paul spent around two years in Ephesus, so a long time. But when he gets there, there's already Christian disciples there. He helps them to come to a greater knowledge and understanding of the faith. So he does still have a big role with them, right? But he's not the founder of the community. So it has a little bit of a different feel. Um, and this letter, um, unlike the other two letters, right? Galatians was very punchy, right? He was trying to correct them for things that they were doing wrong. Ephesians has some of that sense too, but as we'll see, it's more... Um, has, has a different tone, right? It has more of a um, impersonal tone, we might even say. Um, and it's more about teaching, and particularly teaching about, this is the major theme of the letter, the church. What is the church? 
This is something we talked about at the end of Galatians last time. You know, the Gentiles, the Israelites coming together to form this reality, which is the church in which we are still part today. So this letter is all about the church. So it's, again, a nice thing for us to enter into as we're entering into the season of Lent. So why don't we start off again? I always like to get into the mindset of thinking that this is a letter. You know, I think this was written to the early Christians at Ephesus who had known Paul. He had been with them for two years. He had ministered to them. He had taught them. But at this point, you know, they hadn't seen him in a, a couple of years. Right. They hear that he's been in prison, that he's been sent to Rome, that perhaps he's even going to be executed. And then they receive this letter from him in the midst of all that. They receive a letter from him that teaches him the various things that we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks. So with that context, does somebody want to start by reading just the first chapter one, the first two verses? Yeah, go ahead. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to all the saints who are at Jesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God, the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Very good. So there's that initial greeting, right? We remember at all the other letters, the two other letters we read, there's always a greeting, right? Paul starts off these letters again by saying who he is, who is the one that's writing this letter, and greeting those that are going to be receiving it. What's interesting about this is Paul is the only one that's mentioned here, right? Some of the other letters of Paul, there's many other people. His, he mentions his co-workers, people that are with him. In this case, it's just him identified again as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So one sent forth by Jesus to bring about this message. And it's addressed to, I like this, to the holy ones who are in Ephesus. Does anybody have a different translation of holy ones? Yeah. To God's people in Ephesus. To God's people in Ephesus, to the holy ones. Anything else, Pat? To the saints who are. That's the word I was thinking might come up, saints, right? What is it? Um, saints. So the word in Greek itself here, you know, holy ones would be, you know, a, a translation that perfectly makes sense. But the word literally refers to saints, right? Um, this is a, a nice little thing that in the New Testament times, you know, Christians uh, referred to each other many times as saints. What is a saint? Saint is just somebody who is holy, right? Somebody who we understand it now, technically speaking, as somebody who's in heaven, meaning somebody who has fully been glorified and now is in the divine presence, right, would be a saint. For those who are on earth, right, we're, we're striving to be saints, right? So he's referring to these people there as holy ones, as saints already. And does anybody have in their uh, translation any brackets around Ephesus or in Ephesus or parentheses? Yes. Do you have that? Yes. Anybody else have that? I don't have any. Have footnote. You have a footnote? Okay. So the interesting thing about this is, and this tells us a little bit something about the letter, um, you might have those brackets around in Ephesus. Whenever you see brackets like that, if you have, it depends on your translation, sometimes they won't have this. If you have brackets, it usually means that um, in the man, some of the manuscript tradition, now let's explain what that means. When we're reading the Bible, when we're reading this text, of course, this is a translation from Greek, right? So, but what's based, that this text that we have in Greek is based on hundreds of different manuscripts that were passed down for centuries of the same text. And in some cases, the manuscripts differ a little bit on certain words, or they add certain words in. Because if you think about it, when these were copied you know, over the centuries, sometimes there were either mistakes or sometimes there was additions that people were adding in. So sometimes there's a little bit of a difference in these different manuscripts. So in this case, some of the manuscripts don't have in Ephesus. That's why it's in parentheses. Some of the manuscripts just say, to the holy ones who are faithful in Christ Jesus, right? They don't say to the faithful ones in Ephesus. Um, so this leads some to believe that this was, the Ephesians, letter to the Ephesians, was originally um, a letter that was addressed by St. Paul to perhaps multiple different churches in the region, in Asia Minor. And that, you know, this particular one to Ephesus then would add in Ephesus and to another city would add in a different city, right? But that's why it's more of a general kind of letter that could apply to various different communities. So that's one of the theories about this letter is that perhaps it was the word that we use still today, encyclical letter. You heard about the popes having an encyclical letter. What does that mean? It just means it's a letter that was, you know, that's sent around to all around the world, cycles all around the world. So perhaps this could have been an early encyclical letter of St. Paul, meaning he wrote this letter in his imprisonment and said, send this to all of the churches in Asia. 
and they all would have received it. And we we receive it today as to the Ephesians, but that's one of the theories about it. Pat, did you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. Also faithful to asterisks. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, to the saints who are also faithful. Mm. But he doesn't precede it with saying, I've just come back from blah, 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 with so and so. But I thought that was interesting. Who are also, you know, who the saints are also faithful. Yeah, the fact that he's stressing the faithful part of it. Two asterisks around also faithful. So I'm wondering, mm. unusual. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting to you know because you, you can think about him at the end of his life too, you know, thinking back on his ministry and all the places that he's been, and he's writing out these letters, and so you know it's how important it would be to say to these people that have remained faithful this whole time, right, since he first came on to now, kind of like with Galatians too, right, how he had such a desire to see that these people remained faithful and what that would mean to him, again as a as a teacher as a father figure to them that would be something that would give him a lot of um, consolation, let's say, in the midst of, as we'll hear later in the letter, in the midst of his sufferings, right? He's he's in prison right now. He's undergoing a lot of sufferings, even torture perhaps, um, and certainly a lot of anguish as he prepares to die, right? And the people's faith is what's giving him such consolation. So again, when we're reading this whole letter, just keep in mind, he's writing this while he's in prison. I usually give these like Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians as an example, like whenever we feel, you know, like we're in a rough time and like we can't really like, what can I, you know, I'm in such a rough time of anguish and we feel as if, you know, we can't really do the mission, right? We can't really give ourselves a mission because so many things are going wrong. And what was Paul doing when he was imprisoned and again, probably tortured and fearing death? He's writing letters to all these various communities. He's, an, he's exhorting them and he's saying all these wonderful messages in this letter, not just saying, oh, woe is me, right? But as we'll see, having this wonderful message for them. So that's kind of a spiritual lesson that we can draw from this as we're going through the rest of the letter. And then verse two, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this should be reminiscent of the mass, right? With the priest says at the beginning of the mass, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The greeting that we have in the mass, these come directly from the letters of St. Paul, directly from Scripture. So there's our greeting. Now we'll get into this next part, which is interesting. If you remember in the other letters, <clears throat> starts with a greeting, right? Like any of our letters would, dear, you know, so-and-so, I am this person, right? Then in the other letters, do you remember, people remember what he usually turns to right away? He usually has a very effusive section uh, doing something before he gets into the content of what he wants to say. Anybody remember what he usually turns to? Thanksgiving. Remember that? How he would say, you know, I am Paul X, Y, Z, you know, and then he would say, thank you so much for all that you've done and your thank you and thank you, thank you. And especially in Thessalonians, he was like over the top and giving thanks, right? Just like we would in our own letters, right? Usually if we write a letter, the first thing we probably do is we say some kind of Thanksgiving, right? We give thanks. Um, here, you're going to notice he does have the Thanksgiving, but it's a little bit later in the letter. He has this long section for verse three, to verse, um, let's see, 14 of chapter one is all this wonderful um, reflection on really first and foremost a thanksgiving to God more so than to these other people, right? It's a reflection on all the gifts that he and all these people, the saints, the Christians, the faithful people have received from God. He's going to list line by line all these gifts that we've received. So we'll read through this in a second, and I want you to think about, I certainly have my own ideas for this, but how important it is that, again, in the midst of all that he's going through in this moment in his life, he takes this time at the very beginning of the letter to list out all of these many things that he's thankful for, these gifts that he's received from God. So why don't we, um, again, this is also a passage that probably many of us have heard before and at some point or another, so it should sound relatively familiar. So can someone read verses 3 to uh, 6, please? Peter, yeah. Uh, the heading is spiritual blessings in Christ. Mm -hmm. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He destined us in love to be his sons through Jesus Christ, 
according to the purpose of his will. Thank you. So again, I think, again, if we just read this without any context, it doesn't really maybe have the same kind of effect, but think about this for a second, that this is, you know, what is he going through in this moment? He's in prison, he's suffering. And yet what is the first words out of his mouth? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. So it's this wonderful confession. Welcome to those who are coming in. It's this wonderful confession of thanksgiving to the Lord, all the blessings that he's received. Um, for those just coming in, we're in uh, Ephesians, and we're still in chapter one, so we're just uh, just about at verse four of chapter one. So, um, anybody have any thoughts on that? I mean, just it's it's almost astounding to me in a certain sense and it certainly is a great lesson for me and for all of us i think that you know in the midst of all these things he's going through his the first thing out of his mind the first thing he wants them to be you know aware of not for them to be oh oh you must be so terrible blah blah, blah. but the first thing out of his mind is words of blessing he's repeating blessing multiple times that he has received every spiritual blessing in the heavens from god and the fact that he's in the current situation he's in even though as, as bad as it might be that doesn't negate the fact that God is with him and has given him every spiritual blessing in the heavens. It's a powerful statement to start off with. Thank and you. Father, you said that yeah. we're blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Yeah. Um, we came late because I've just looked you at mass. Yes. I apologize. No, no problem. Well, I don't know how important you can get, I guess. Thank you for coming. Yes. Welcome. We're yeah. so excited to be yeah. here with you. Thank you for coming. Uh, let's see if we have a Bible. Christ, the mind of Christ. Oh, yes. That blessing pouring into what we've been talking about this week in our marriage retreat. So when I heard that you said this in Ephesians, that's when I thought, oh my goodness, yes. Perfect. Thank you yeah. Deb, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming, yeah. I, I hope, do you do you have Bibles there? Or we, yeah, we had some, but I think they all yeah, were. We okay, perfect. Okay, great. So we did have, I brought some, but everybody, we, everybody took them all, so, um, which is good. Um, so yeah, just the fact that, you know, again, the first thing on his mind, a blessing is well received. How, I mean, how can we learn from that? I mean, there's so many times when we are going through difficult things and the first thing in our mind is not that, right? And yet Paul is saying, no, this is the, certainly it's grace that's working in him to allow him to do that, right? But his the first thing on his mind is is this first confession of the blessings he received from God. And then as, we, as we'll see, again, he goes through all of these spiritual blessings he's received. The heading you said that you had in yours was spiritual. Can you read that again? Spiritual blessings in Christ. Exactly. So, so that's a great way of putting it. Mine, mine doesn't have that as a, as a heading, but that's a great way of putting it because it's basically saying he's going to list out the spiritual blessings that he's received. He may not have material blessings in this moment, right? He doesn't have freedom, material freedom. He doesn't have necessarily material health at this point, like physical health. He doesn't have material goods and things to boast on, but he has spiritual blessings and he lists these out at the beginning. So again, this is a powerful lesson for us that we're in these diff difficult moments, right? We can recall to ourselves the spiritual blessings. Even we might say, we could even, like, if we're going through a difficult moment, we could even read this passage to remind ourselves, okay, everything might be going wrong in these other ways, but what are the spiritual blessings that I have that are, uh, you know, nothing, none of these depend on the material or physical things happening in my life. They all depend on simply who God is and who I am in relation to God. So what are these things? Verse four, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blemish before him. What is this first spiritual blessing that we, each one of us has? That God has called us before the, this is an amazing phrase. You've probably heard this phrase many times. This is where it comes from in Ephesians. Before the foundation of the world, God has called us to holiness. You probably heard the term before, Vatican II really uh, emphasized it, but it's certainly something that's been in our tradition all the way from the beginning, from this to you know now, the universal call to holiness, which means every single person, each one of us is called to be holy, to be a saint. There we come back to that word that we talked about at the beginning, right? To be holy is to be a saint, right? We're all called to that. So the fact that we have been called from before the foundation of the world, before the world even existed, right? God knew who we were. God wanted us to, had a certain plan for us in place, even if we didn't exist yet in his reality. And he, he is calling us from the beginning to holiness. I think it's Isaiah 4. I call 
told you by your name and you weren't mine. That kind of reminds me of that. Exactly. Any other, that's a great point, Jane. Any other passages from the scriptures that you think of or lines of scriptures or, or particularly the Old Testament that are similar to that? I think of, you know, Jeremiah saying from, from my mother's womb, the fact that we've been called from our mother's womb, right? The prophets in the Old Testament always speak in this language of, you know, God has called me from, and I, I, obviously it's coming from God that they are have this insight, right? That from the very beginning, they have been called to this holiness, right? That God's vocation, it's not something that like is added in later on. It's like, oh, you're doing good. So now I'm going to give you the vocation of holiness. No, this is from the beginning, right? Before the foundation of the world, from mother's womb, from the very beginning that this call has taken place. And this is the first spiritual blessing. A lot of us, I think we don't even take into account that this is a blessing, right? We are blessed because God didn't have to do this, right? He didn't have to call us from before the foundation of the world to holiness, right? But he, ch he chooses to out of love for each and every one of us. So this is a blessing that we receive, that we have. And, you know, again, it should be the first thing in our mind. You know, I don't think we wake up in the morning thinking, oh, wow, thank you, Lord, for, you know, calling me from the foundation of the world to holiness, right? Probably not. But this could be really the first thing, one of the first things that we, in our prayer, that we say, Lord, thank you for this call of holiness that I have received, that you desire me to be holy. Sometimes I don't think, sometimes we get in a low point in our life and we think, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be holy, you know, I'm not supposed to be a saint, right? That's for other people, you know. It's like, no, God is calling you to be a saint, to be holy. And that's from the beginning, right? Doesn't That doesn't change based on anything that you do. Yeah. That goes back to the other letters then where he, cho he chose you before the foundation of the world. And it's explained in the other letters. And your job is to act, answer. Exactly. Because exactly. You, he can call you all day. And if you don't answer. Exactly. Yes, that's exactly true. What Peter said, which is that this is an invitation. It's a challenge, really, uh, meaning I've chosen you. Same thing with the prophets, right? Because the prophets, as we know, we had Jonah today in the first reading, right? A lot of the prophets, right? They kind of they 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 know their call. It's not that they know. It's not that they doubt that they're called, right? They know their call is very clear to them, and yet they kind of you know they turn away or they do this or do that, and then eventually they obviously come to to respond to the Lord's call. So. It's one thing to be called. It's another thing to respond to the call, right? And that's the case with us too, right? When we sin, what is sin? It means that we're turning away in some way from that call to holiness that we have from the beginning. That's what sin is. And so we have to turn back, right? We are, it's, a, it's a constant, you know, journey of turning back, but always keeping in mind, this is the, the basis of it, that we do have this call to holiness. And that's our primary vocation. You know, we talk about vocation, most of the time we think of like particular vocations, like vocation to the priesthood, vocation to the married life. Those are obviously true vocations. But our primary vocation as a Christian people is to holiness. So we're all called to holiness, to be a saint. And then there's a particular way, particular vocation in which that's carried out. So this is our this is our primary vocation. Again, it comes right from the scriptures, right? Right from here, right from St. Paul. So that's the first blessing. What's the second blessing? Going to verse 5. In love, again, always, like how he, he, he emphasizes in love, meaning God didn't have to do any of this, right? This is God's gracious gift to us, right? He didn't have to necessarily call us the holiness. He didn't have to do all the things he's going to say now. But in love, he decides to do this, right? So in love, verse 5, he destined us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ in accord with the favor of his will for the praise of the glory of his grace that he granted us in the beloved. So what is the second blessing? So the first one, we're called to holiness from the foundation of the world. The second one is that we are destined. Anyone have a different word there in verse five for destined in their translation? Predestined. Predestined yeah. Any Anything else? Destined, I think, is, what's that? Decided. Oh, decided. That one's even more, you know, uh, firm, like saying not even destined, but decided, right? So we're destined for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ. So not only does God, you know, make us uh, and, and call us holiness from the beginning, he destines us or predestines us for adoption as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. How is it, as we heard in the other letters, that particularly that we are made adopted sons and daughters of God through baptism, right? 
It's baptism that renders us as adopted sons and daughters of God. So that's what he means by saying adopted through Jesus Christ, through what Jesus did, and our entrance into his passion and death through our baptism. We are made adopted sons and daughters of God. So why is this like another step above what he's already saying? He goes, he didn't just create you, you know, and, and give you this call of holiness from the beginning. He also wants to actually adopt you as his sons and daughters and to destine you for that. That's a huge deal to be adopted by God. And that's who we are, right? We are our primary identity. There was a, we had a talk last night um, from, it was the Young Catholic Professionals Group was over at St. Mary's and they had a panel discussion and they had three different um, speakers. And one of them was one of the Little Sisters of the Poor from up in Enfield, love their community, they're the best. And um, the sister that gave her talk you know, it was it was more meant to be like kind of a business uh, focused talk. They had people from different, you know, um, fields and business and all that kind of stuff talking about their career path and everything. And she has a very successful career in her, you know, in her community in terms of running different nursing homes throughout the country. Right. And yet I loved how she began. The first thing she said when they introduced her before she got into all the business stuff, she said, she said, my primary identity. And I thought she was going to say is like a religious sister and everything. She said. My primary identity is a baptized Christian, an adopted daughter of God. And the particular way in which I fulfill that is through a vocation to the religious life. And then she went on to say, and I've done all these many things and my, you know, I've done this and that. But I was like, that's so perfect. Like as Christians, our primary identity is as baptized individuals, meaning exactly what they're saying. What is what is baptism mean? It means we're adopted as sons and daughters of God. So we're called to that holiness, and then we respond in the affirmative by seeking baptism, which means being adopted as sons and daughters of God. That's the primary identity we have. And so this is really the second blessing. The first blessing, again, that we have is called holiness, and the second blessing that we're able to respond to that. Again, this goes back to what Peter was saying, right? The call and the response. We're able to respond to that by being baptized, by becoming adopted sons and daughters of God. And that dignity never goes away, even if we sin gravely, right? and we're out of communion with God, we still have, our identity is still, I mean, it's, it's an identity that needs to be, you know, restored in some way and remade in some way and reconciled, but we still have an identity as we're still a son and daughter of God. So that's something that we always retain. Yeah, Pat? Well, it's just that sentence, and it's uh, that you're supporting the purpose of his will. And that, that brings another level. Um, of what our vocation is, we're not just called to worship him and so on, but according to his will. Yes. And, and I, I think, unlike most of us, as you point out, St. Paul was in prison and he's still praising God. Mm-hmm. Most of us, when things go well, what did I do? I didn't hit you. Know, why is God doing this to me? Exactly. You know, how calm it's happening and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I think that according to his will is a really big deal. Yes. Yeah, I agree with you. Because that is so important. It's one thing to, you know, uh, you know, to to do what we think involves service to the Lord or service to God, and it's another thing to do what is the Lord's will for me, right? Because He's the one who calls from the beginning. So it's it's according to His will that we have to fulfill our vocation, right? This is a huge part of the spiritual life, right? God knows us better than we know ourselves. So if we are going to truly fulfill ourselves, it involves knowing God really well, right? I, I think I said this before in another uh, Bible study, but, you know, think about this for a second, that um, knowledge, we're told, is a gift of the Spirit. That means knowledge of God, obviously, meaning, you know, we can't truly know who God is, obviously, without God revealing that to us, because he's God, right? But it also means self-knowledge is a gift of the Spirit, so think about that for a second. What does that mean? It means that we can't truly know ourselves. We can think we know ourselves, right? We can think we know all there is to know about ourselves. But our faith tells us we can't fully know ourselves except by God revealing that to us. So it's through our prayer, through our relationship that God reveals to us who we are, what our purpose is, and how we're supposed to fulfill our vocation, again, based on his will. So it's all keeping in in mind the fact that God is is supreme. He's the one that calls. He's the one that gives the vocation. He's the one that's going to give us the strength and show us how to fulfill that in our life. So it's a great point. Any other ideas? Or yeah, go ahead. Well, I just um, as I listen to you, speak, I'm thinking about how the Holy Spirit constantly gives me what I need to fulfill my vocation. Mm-hmm. And so it's not that I'm trying to fulfill my vocation. 
Yes. I like the word you just use. And we talk about the spirit being poured into us as like a deposit. That is Ephesians language. If you look down at the end of this beautiful, these listing of the spiritual blessings in, in verse 14, again, there's different translations of this. Mine has in verse 14, the spirit being poured into us is the first installment of our inheritance toward redemption as God's possession. Some of you might have deposit or something like that. Um, but what is he saying here? We'll talk about this. This is, this is the concluding line of this beautiful listing of all these spiritual blessings. So it's really the kind of the culminating moment of this all. But this last part he's saying is that, you know, the spirit poured into our hearts in baptism, right? And then continually throughout our lives as Christians through prayer and through the sacraments. That's the first installment, the deposit, meaning, you know, that's the, the pledge of what's to come, right? We receive, again, again I've said this before, I think, too, but the, the life of a Christian disciple is now and not yet at the same time, right? We have now already the spirit. We have the first installment, but not yet have we received the full, you know, fruition of that, which is to say to be glorified in heaven. So there's a now and there's also a not yet. There's kind of this, um, you know, we have this film, but we're also waiting for the full fulfillment to come. So that's a great point. Yeah. Any other thoughts so far on this? And these, these are just the first two blessings. He hasn't even gotten into some of the other ones, right? So again, it's like, you know, things that we can call to mind, like Pat was just saying, you know, when we, when we're going through a rough time, we're not necessarily going to be thinking about this way. Um, and yet he is by God's grace. So we, we pray for the same thing for us. And again, I think this passage is especially helpful when we're in, we're in those times to just read through this and remind ourselves. So let's see, what's the next one. So if somebody want to read, um, we'll read all the, actually we'll do seven through 10. So we'll read all the way through this passage. Um, but then we'll obviously go hone in on each one. So somebody want to read verse seven through 10. Yeah, go ahead, Pat. For he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Thank you. So what's this next one? So again, we're, we're called, we have a universal vocation to holiness from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. Then we respond to that and we're adopted as sons and daughters. That's our primary identity as Christian disciples. Then what's the next thing in verse seven? In him, we have redemption by his blood, which is to say the forgiveness of transgressions, forgiveness of sins in accord with the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. So we have forgiveness of our sins through what God has done for us. So again, this is a recognition, as Paul is saying, that even though we're adopted, as it was just mentioned, even though we're adopted as sons and daughters through baptism, even though that we, that's our primary identity, you know, we're weak human beings and we're, we're going to fall into sin, right? That's part of what it means to be human, a fallen state of humanity, right? Is that we're prone to sin. And yet even that is not an end, right? It's not as if because we sin that there's no hope for us, right? But God has, again, in the language Paul used, lavishes upon us his mercy, that he allows forgiveness of our transgressions, which is even more. Again, he didn't have to do that, right? God could have said, okay, these are, this is your shot, right? I, I call you to holiness. Then I give you this wonderful gift of baptism, which is basically remission of all your sins. You're, you're good to go. You're adopted son or daughter. But then he could have said, but after that, you, you're, it's, you're, up, you know, you're on your own, right? If you sin, if you fall into sin, see you later, right? He could have, he could have done that, right? And what does he do? Instead, he says, no, I'm going to give you the opportunity to receive forgiveness of your sins, to be reconciled. And in the current practice of the church, as we've talked about many times, right, in this study, of uh, the current practice of the church, we can receive forgiveness of our sins as many times as we want, as we need to, in the sacrament of reconciliation. As we talked about in other areas of the church, that was not the case. You had either one shot, maybe two shots, right? Now we can go to reconciliation as many times as we need to, which is an amazing gift, right? So again, this is the fact that God has, God, I love that word, it lavishes upon us his mercy. He's like, you know, I know it's tough. I know you're going to fall into sin and I will give you this opportunity to be forgiven of sins. So this is the third uh, spiritual blessing, which I'm sure all of us, you know, know the reality of this and how important this is, right? 
and we can give thanks to God. Like for all the times that we've gone to confession, we can say, thank you, Lord, that you, that you give me that opportunity. Again, you don't have to, you didn't have to. And yet in love, you've given me this opportunity. What an amazing blessing that is. And also this is kind of a cool um, personal moment for Paul, right? Because Paul himself is saying like, again, he's saying, he's using the first plural here, meaning we. He's not saying you have received all the things you, he's saying we, meaning he himself has also received this ministry of mercy throughout his life. And he's thankful for that as well. Obviously we know Paul's story, right? He was very much opposed to Christianity for a long time, right? Was killing Christians, right? And then he receives God's mercy and continually does throughout his lifetime. So this is the third great spiritual blessing that I'm sure we all, any, any comments on that or thoughts on that before we move on to the next one? I know I'm thankful for this one, <laughs> certainly. And what's the next one? And all, so this is going on through verse eight into nine. In all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will in accord with his favor that he set forth in him as a plan for the fullness of times to sum up all things in Christ and heaven and on earth. So what is this fourth thing? Again, this can seem like something that isn't really something we would even necessarily identify as a great blessing that we have received. But it's a fact that God reveals to us something of the mystery of his design for the world and for humanity. Again, God does not have to do this. He does not have to reveal to us that we have a part in this plan or that we have a vocation that's somehow fulfilling his divine will for humanity, right? He doesn't have to do that, but yet he reveals to us something of this mystery and allows us to take part in this adventure of bringing it about to fulfillment. Here in, um, in verse nine, again, I want to see people have other translations. Mine says, he has made known to us the mystery of his will. Anybody have a different wording there? A secret plan. So mystery there is in Greek, mysterion is, you know, so mystery would be the most, um, you know, the best translation, but secret plan. Anything else? Pat, did you have something? No, I, I think oh. the, cons the conciseness of the language in the RSV here is very important because mm. uh, you know, and you haven't gotten it yet, that thematically, the mystery of his will is what Paul is going to lay out. Mm -hmm. um, but there's an expression that came into my head when I was doing the lectio on this, mm -hmm. and trying to, you know, let what words came to me. Yeah. Um, was um, you know the mystery of Christ concealed but now revealed. Uh, mm -hmm. And then obviously the exposition on you know because we need we need particulars. Mm -hmm. um, how he's made known this to us. Mm -hmm. uh, because prior to that, we talked about redemption through his blood, which we understand that conceptually, mm -hmm. and and the grace he gives us through that redemption to to fulfill our offer of adoption. Um, yes. It, it was interesting, and I don't know whether I saw it in a footnote or whatever, mm -hmm. but it, there's like a connection or a contrast, I should say, with what we to death in, in Galatians about circumcision, yeah. that baptism replaces that mm. because that's the sign, the indelible mark yeah. conferred on us through the Trinitarian formula of our baptism. That gives us the mark, which is the new covenant. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and not something that would be externally visible because you wouldn't know. You know, you can't tell if somebody's baptized by looking at the person. Um, but because it's an interior reality, but, uh, but no less real, right? Like we, you know, especially as Catholics, we believe that, right? That sacraments are real reality. You know, they, they really do change us, right? Other Christian denominations say, oh, it's just, you just pour water and that's it. It's like, but this is actually having a real interior effect of transformation, just like the other sacraments too, right? And, um, and it, it ties back to another point, and this is a hard doctrine. It was probably the most difficult for me to accept uh, and it's not it's not one of your core courses, if you will, when you get into the whole doctrine of predestination. So let's park that there for a second. Yeah. But he uses the predestined. And I think it's important to point out that what he means are those who have been newly baptized. He, he's talking about a subset 
of humanity who have been predestined to hear and respond to the call. Mm -hmm. and, and that puts a burden on us as Catholics for those who believe in Christ but don't have the fullness of proof to use the proper church language. Yeah. Um, and, and unknowingly, you know, like I, I, I thank the Lord every day that I was born into this church because I don't know that I would have found my way yeah. w where I am, mm -hmm. okay? And to have, you know, the instruments of God's grace through the sacraments, which are not accepted and then actually wholly rejected in some mm -hmm. Protestant circles or, or churches that are, mm -hmm. are created. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, it, it's one thing to sort of understand the language but I think it's important in our spiritual journey to be seeking an application for what we have learned. Exactly. And I would suggest, and this is tough, that, that we have to radiate the joy of Christ that is within us. We have to bear witness to the truth, capital T. Um, and, and we have to try to, I'll say subtly at first, until you can begin conversations if people are receptive mm -hmm. to draw them to the one true faith, mm -hmm. you know, in, in its fullness, mm -hmm. uh, because we are called to spread the word, mm -hmm. you know, can't, can't be left to the priests alone. Mm -hmm. You know, we're more out in the world, uh, you know, all due respect than, mm -hmm. than, than most of our priests and religious are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is exactly, <clears throat> excuse me. This is exactly what this, um, this fourth, you know, spiritual blessing is about. It's about getting us towards the the mission aspect of who we are. You know, he's saying we're called from the foundation of the world. We're adopted. We see forgiveness of sins. But all of this is pointed towards the fact that there's some kind of mission that we have to fulfill, and that God again is, and this is the blessing, is revealing in some sense what that mystery is to us. I want to go back to something you said, which is perfect way of wording it. What is mystery, right? When we, the word mystery, mysterion in Greek, it means something that is revealed partly, but also concealed, right? Something that we can come to a knowledge of, but we can never fully grasp, right? Like God is obviously a mystery. We can come to know God and who God is through revelation, but we can never obviously fully grasp who God is, right? The Trinity is a mystery. We can come to some knowledge of it, but we can't come to a full, right? So there's something that's revealed, but also concealed. And so this is what Paul is saying here is the blessing that ultimately God's will in our lives for us individually, but also for the world is a mystery, right? We can never fully know. This is like Isaiah, right? Going back to Isaiah. We can never fully know God's ways and how they're working in our life. We trust by faith, as Paul tells us, right? That, you know, God is at work for the good of all things for those who, who know, love and serve him, right? So we trust that. We don't necessarily know how that's going to work out in our day-to-day -day circumstances, right? There's a mystery there. Um, but he's saying, what's the blessing? That God has actually revealed some of that to us, right? If we are people of faith, if we make ourselves disposed to him through prayer, through all these other means, right? That there is going to be, he is going to reveal to us in, in a certain sense what that will is, what that vocation is, which means what, what our service is going to be, what our mission is going to be, how we're going to take all that we've received, our call, our vocation, our forgiveness of sins, or, you know, all those things, and use that for the mission that's in front of us. So this is getting us towards the mission aspect of it. Um, and what is this plan? As he says in verse 10, right again, this mystery of his will, it's a plan for the fullness of times to sum up, this is my translation here, to sum up all things in Christ in heaven and on earth. That is ultimately the plan God's designed for all of humanity, right? To sum up all things in Christ, right? That Christ be all in all. Yeah, go ahead. So just to go with ten, if I read nine and ten together, that, sure. that sounds like the simplest form of the revelation, right there. Yeah. Yep. In Jesus, heaven, earth, done. Yeah. Well, that's when the mystery will be fully revealed to us. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's, that's an important component yeah. of what heaven is. Exactly. That things that we that are revealed mm -hmm. to us that we kind of like in a dense fog, mm -hmm. you know, it'll be clear. Exactly. That's the fullness of the revelation. Yeah. And in my um, my translation, I like the word for the fullness of time to unite mm. all things. That's good. Yeah. In him. Yeah. Yeah, that is nice. And I like uh, what Peter said because <clears throat> Paul is so good with this. Um, 
throughout his letters, he has these um, very brief summaries of the gospel, essentially. So there'll be like one or two or three verses, which basically are a summary of what we call the kerygma, which basically means a presentation of the gospel. And many scholars, you know, some scholars get too, you know, scholarly about it and they lose sight of like what actually is this meant, you know, but what they propose as what these are is essentially like, you know, when Paul was going around, I mean, he was the greatest evangelist of the early church, probably of the church in general, right? And he was going around and he was preaching the charisma, the faith to many different people. And sometimes in a very brief way, right? He was maybe just like an elevator pitch basically. And so he would have had these ready to go, right? And in many cases, he was the one who came up with these, right? Who formulated these. Um, so when he's writing his letters, sometimes he'll either because he's deliberately trying to say, okay, here's the, here's the charisma again, or just because it's part of his language at that, that time, at that, at that point, because it's so much a part of who he is, right? He, he uses these throughout his letters. And we can imagine probably this is something he could have preached to somebody, right? He would have said very clearly, like, this is what the gospel is all about. It's about, you know, this has been re this revelation to us that we are called to be part of uniting all things in Christ in heaven and on earth, right? That's it right there. That, and for us, it's good to go back to these things and say, okay, this is what it's all about, right? At the end of the day, this reminds us, brings us back to what our, what our goal is essentially. That's what our, what our, we're part of, again, this is also a very consoling thing for us, right? It doesn't matter, you know, even though we're just one person in a billion, billions of people in the world, billions of people throughout centuries, right? We are part of this plan. We've been called to be a part of this plan in some small way through the fulfillment of our vocation as a mother, as a father, as a priest, as a whatever, to, um, to bring about this plan. Except that it is in Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. the mystery in mm -hmm. his life. Mm -hmm. But it isn't like we know now exactly what this all exactly. is to this day. We, we really don't. Yes. I mean, we believe. And through the spirit, we are guided. I think in, in many times in our lives, we have moments of what, illumination kind of thing, where we understand a particular thing we think anyway uh, about this. But it's interesting because it's a mystery. Thank yes. You, yeah. So to say that, well, now we know, mm -hmm. we don't. Exactly. We know that there is a mystery and it revolves around the life of Christ. We know that if we're incorporated into that, we become part of, but we don't know what mm -hmm. the real. Am I crazy? I'm just thinking about no. that. No. No, that's <laughs> that's what's so. Listening to you all is like, wait yeah. No, that's so that's what's so that's that. yes, that's <laughs> well, that's why, that's why that word is so important. The church refers yeah. to a foretaste of something. Right. We've heard that phrase, right? right. A foretaste yeah. of what heaven right. is like. A foretaste of what a relationship with God is like. I think that refers to what you're saying. You don't know at all. You just you just kind of get a glimpse. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you get a, a, a foretaste. And that's why that, that word is so, like, why is it so important that he says the mystery of his will in accord with his favor, right? Because it's a mystery. We can't fully know, and we're not going to know. Like, think about it this way. Paul is, you know, <clears throat> he's done all these great things. He's been preaching around the world, and people would say, oh, that's God's will. That's his plan coming into effect pretty clearly. Like, that seems pretty clear. But then what's happening when he writes this letter? He's in prison, right? And he's going to die, and he's losing his appeal before the emperor, and he's like, I'm probably going to die, right? So some would say, wait, how is that bringing about God's plan, right? It's a mystery. He doesn't know, you know, we don't know why that ha that was allowed and why that's happening. Obviously, in the fullness of time, we understand, oh, he, that happens so that, you know, because once he was he was killed, right, he became one of the greatest saints in our tradition, right, interceding in heaven for the church, right? Um, but in that moment, right, in, in, in that particular moment, which he's writing this letter, he would think to himself, wow, this is a mystery to me. That's part of the reason I think why he's using this word is because he finds himself in front of that mystery. He's like, I don't know the full reason how, or how this is all going to take place. But I know by faith that God's will is being brought about if we are, you know, docile to him. Yeah. Monsignor Charles Pope in D.C. says it's like um, our head is in an elevator already in heaven in Christ, mm. but our body is still mm. here and elevator could be going down, but still we're ultimately <laughs> destined to be fully united with the head, which is Christ. Yeah. Yeah.
and it's going to be a struggle. That's that's the thing about you know the Christian life. Again, we talk about this all the time, right? That you know what is, what is the scriptures constantly saying? Like life's going to be a struggle, right? It's going to be a struggle, and it should be. If it's not a struggle, then we're doing something wrong. We're complacent, or we haven't really understood the gospel, or or something, you know. Uh, but it's going to be that struggle that we we. We know what's what's destined for us, and yet we still have trouble f- figuring out what that is. And we go through dark moments. We can't see the light ahead of us, right? That's why going back to something like this is so important to remind us of what truly matters and these blessings that we do have. Any other comments up to this point? That was a good discussion we had. <clears throat> Finally, we come to verses 11 through <clears throat> 14, which continue, again, this listing of the spiritual blessings. And they also, this is going to focus in on the particular theme of this letter, which, as I mentioned, is the church. What is the church, the role of the church, and our place within it? So somebody want to read verses 11 through 14? Yes, Harriet, thank you. In him we are also chosen, destined in accord with the purpose of the one who accomplishes all things according to the intentions of his will, so that we might exist for the praise of his glory. We who first hoped in Christ, in him you also who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the first installment of our inheritance <clears throat> towards redemption as God's <clears throat> procession to the praise of his glory. Yes. So... This last, um, it's really sort of a twofold blessing, but one in terms of what it's speaking of, again, from verse 11 to 14, is the fact that, you know, based on all of this that we just talked about, based on the fact that we're called to holiness from the beginning, that we're adopted as sons of God or through baptism, that we have forgiveness of sins through the sacrifice of the church, that we have a mission to go forth, all of that is gathered up together and we're all gathered together in the fact that we're all part of the the church, right? We're all elected. We're chosen. He says in him, we are also chosen, destined to be existing in this reality, which we understand to be the church, right? We are all members of the church. And he here in verse 12, as opposed to in verse 13 to 14, he's talking again about these two groups. We talked about this last week, right? The two groups that are the foundation of the early church, does anybody remember what these are? People coming from two different traditions? Jews and Gentiles. Exactly. Very good. So the Jewish Christians, right? People who come from the Jewish faith, right? Who were followers of the Jewish law, like Paul was himself, right? He was a Pharisee, as we talked about. People who come from the Jewish faith who came to faith in Christ as the fulfillment of their faith. And then, as opposed to that, people who come from the Gentiles, meaning people who are not Jewish in terms of their faith, who are pagans, right, following different pagan gods from all different parts of the Roman Empire, who then come to faith in Jesus, right? And one could say, oh, there's these two different groups, right, who are kind of at odds with each other. But both of these come together in the church, right? The church joins together these two groups. So that's what, again, most, how I would read this, how most people read this when he says, when he's talking about we, right, in verse 12, so that we might exist for the praise of his glory, we who first hoped in Christ, who is the we here? So I well, thought that would, it says here in my footnotes that it was the Jews. Exactly. That's how most would read this, including myself. And which then I have a footnote for the sixth blessing. Exactly. So the, this, the fifth one would be the blessing that, again, the we, which I would understand to be, again, the Jewish Christians, meaning Paul, who came from the Jewish faith, and those others with him who came to faith, as he says, who first hoped in Christ, right? The ones who first... Um, came to Christ, right? That were the Jewish people who had faith, right? As opposed to those who didn't, right? Um, so that's a blessing that they they have come to faith first, right? But then in verse 13, in him, you also, now he, he changes from we to you. Again, most would understand this to be referring to you, the Gentile Christians. You also, and again, the Ephesians were Gentiles, right? They were people coming from, you know, a different part of the world than Israel, obviously. And many of them were were pagans, right, before they could, just like the Galatians were too. In him, you also, you Ephesians, you Gentiles, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the first and solemn of our inheritance toward redemption. So again, what is the fifth and the sixth blessing, these final blessings, spiritual blessings, that both Jew and Gentile, meaning 
every person throughout the world has the opportunity to come to faith in Jesus. And through baptism, again, meaning through the promised gift of the Holy Spirit, receiving this first installment, as we talked about already, this deposit of an inheritance toward redemption as God's possession, through baptism are made one, elected as one in the church. So again, here's these the all these spiritual blessings, these six blessings. We're called from the foundation of the world to holiness. We're adopted through baptism as sons and daughters of God. We receive forgiveness of sins through the sacraments of the church, right? We have a, a certain vocation that is revealed to us, a mystery, but yet that it's revealed to us for our service. And then finally, that that vocation takes place in the context of the church, right? Of this, the Jews, Gentiles coming together, joined together by faith in Christ through baptism in the Holy Spirit to be this community that, that goes forth in mission. So the last blessing is really the church, right? That each one of us, no matter our background, obviously today the whole distinction of Jew and Gentile isn't as effective for us. Why? Because we're all, gen for the most part, we're all Gentile Christians, meaning we we were, most of us were, you know, from a Gentile origin, right? Um, but what is, what is the spiritual message of this? That no matter what your background is, no matter if you were baptized as an infant or baptized as an adult, no matter if you where you're from, your cultural background, your linguistic background, right? We all can come together through baptism in this one community of the church, which is where we fulfill our vocation to do all these things, right? To serve the Lord God and to preach the gospel. So again, the last blessing is the church, which is the, the theme of the rest of the letter. If you look forward in your headings in verse 15 and onward, you probably see something, something about the unity of the church or something, something about the church as a body of Christ, right? So the church is this major message that he's going to go into. So that's the last blessing. Salvation. That's the same thing. Are you using it? Yeah. Oh, does yours say salvation? Yeah, right. Yeah. It's focused on mm -hmm. so quite a bit of ladder. Exactly. Yet, yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, um, like mine says, unity of the church in Christ. And then under that, the church is Christ's body. Verse 15. Um, yeah. Maybe your heading might say something different based on salvation. But obviously the church is. The vessel in which right. we, you know, we're, so it's related, obviously, but yeah. Um, okay, so that brings us right up to time. Any final thoughts or anything anybody wants to say before we conclude? Actually, that was that worked very well. We got right through the the first. Um, like yeah, that was by our standards. That, but again, what is this the important thing? You know, when you're going through a rough time, and you feel like and everything could be, in a worldly sense, totally shattering around us. We go back to um, these spiritual blessings, because again, no matter what's happening in our world, if we're in prison, if we're gonna, you know, if we're on death's doorstep, we're gonna be killed for, you know, faith as Paul was, right? These spiritual blessings are still there, and they're still operative. So there are things that we can turn back to in the midst of everything else. So let's conclude with prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we give you thanks for gathering us this day, as we continue to reflect on your Word. And we give thanks, as St. Paul did so many centuries ago, we give thanks for these many spiritual blessings that all of us have received and continue to draw much fruit from, especially during this time of Lent. We ask your blessing upon our Lenten observances that they might be fruitful for us in drawing more closely to Christ and to his resurrection. And we ask this in all things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let me end this.